Dr. Westman, so I have, uh, I have a question for the entire panel. So Nina, you talked about the guidelines and the need for us to uh, change them and respond to new evidence. Dave, you've uh, championed the LMHR and what it's taken to uh, produce some studies. Dr. Nadir Ali, you challenged us to think about uh, potentially lowering our fat in some situations. And Dr. Karimnas here, you've uh, highlighted how uh, CAC have been a or am I getting cut off? CACs have been uh, largely ignored uh, by the medical community until very recently. Uh, in fact, you faced fierce opposition to something so evidence-based. And Dr. Diamond, the conventional approach to statins. So can you talk about how we're going to fight the convention? So just to clarify, this is within the medical world, how we can change things or how we could do guideline change? It's a big question. Medical world? Okay, so how, could, how would you recommend making change? Like everyone just, yeah, pass the, the mic. Oh. The world is a very different place now than it was even 10, 20 years ago because of the internet. It used to be an organization such as the American Heart Association could control um, the information. And the pharma still has a great deal of control over medical education. But I think meetings like this, publications like ours, learning more about um, the coronary calcium, which is somewhat independent of cholesterol, uh, I think this new information that we have that's being shared on the internet, um, I, I think has made it a very different world. So I don't think we're gonna get the American Heart Association to change, and I don't think it's, it's not easy to get the dietary guidelines to change, so we need a groundswell. Um, that comes from uh, groups that are attending this meeting, the Facebook groups and others. Um, and I think ultimately we have to reach a tipping point in which we can force a change on those who are currently in power. Uh, well, I, I have a more optimistic view. And I've seen change happen. So again, change is hard. Um, it's very hard to pivot from what you believe and what you think. What I've also seen is the word has become more polarized. It's always or. Lipids always is the answer. Statin is always the answer. Or statin side effect is the issue. I, I, I think so it's more in between, something in between. And the only way in moving forward is developing consensus and finding areas of collaboration because in all honesty, the group that's out here doesn't need much more education in this space, right? You're all believers. You all see what it needs. Now, how do you get the rest of the world see the facts? Can the guidelines change? They can. We have shown it. It can. But it needs vigor. It needs to build a village, and you have to build a momentum which will snowball down. But you can't take a polarized stand and say nothing's going to happen so in 10 years, we'll still have the same discussion on this panel and keep on pointing to the US guidelines. We need a collaborative team of folks like Dave and REST and the scientists coming together to build those studies where everything builds on each other. Because otherwise, we, I can assure you, if we do not pivot in this approach and thinking that it's all AHN, all pharmaceutical, and there are problems, but people are willing to listen if you do the right thing in the right manner and in a collaborative fashion. So that's my advice. That's why I'm very optimistic, and I think so. Thanks, Dave, for pushing the science forward, and I'm very happy that we have folks like you doing this. That's the point I agree on, that Dave Feldman is doing some very seminal work that I bow my hat to. But I think that the change is going to come from grounds up, not from top down. Because the top is so much with conflict of interest. Perhaps the American Heart Association is one of the most corrupt organizations in this world. With the amount of funding that they get from pharmaceutical industry, that it's only grassroots that is going to change the paradigm because now there is even knowledge between people like you and experts. The leveling, the playing field has leveled. 
And it's not going to happen without the efforts that Nina does in pointing out to you that how these guidelines are out of touch with what metabolic health can be. Thank you. Two things. Transparency. We need more transparency in science, full stop, full stop. We need more of these large data sets that are captured with research to be available for additional independent analyses. And how do I define transparency? It's whether or not skeptics of that study have access to it without barriers to entry. That's how I define transparency. If we have more transparency, we'll do a lot better in my opinion. But on top of that, for goodness sakes, can we please study more healthy populations, full stop? Can we, if we have more data on healthy populations, we'll have a better sense of what really does and doesn't matter. And the, part of the problem is, is we have so many studies, endless amounts of studies that have generally populations that are metabolically challenged, we're dealing with a number of issues, and then we extrapolate from that what we think healthy populations should have for the reference ranges. That's what I would change, and I think those two would change quite a bit in, in nutritional science. That's my opinion. Um, no, I, I think that more and better science is part of the solution. I mean, when Verda came out with its five-year results and presented them at the last American Diabetes Association meeting and showed remission of type 2 diabetes, and there is no other nutritional approach except for maybe Mediterranean with that length of a study, that was, that was mind-changing for a lot of the people at that conference. So data will make a difference, but I don't think that this debate is really about science. I think the people in this room are responding to science. There, there are some doctors that respond to science, but all of you know doctors who look at you having reversed your diabetes and saying, isn't that dangerous, that diet you're on? So even before their very eyes. And I just, I presented data in my talk about how our policymakers, despite reviewing, you know, 89% of the studies in their own review, saying one thing, they say another. So a lot of this is not about the science. So I'll just say, <laughs> I'll be brief. But we need to, as others have said, we need to organize this grassroots movement. We need to do things like, you know, uh, patients for choice. They want low-carb meals in hospitals. Um, parents for improving school meals. We want parents of teenage girls who've gone vegan. Parents who don't want their schools to go vegan on Fridays. We need a bunch of these different movements, and we need to aim that grassroots power at pow the power in Congress and influencers at st in state levels. You need to aim your energy somewhere to create change. That is, I think, how we're going to create change. And we also need a lot of money behind PR and TikTok videos and people like there's, that is where the war is happening for information. We know it because everybody's gone vegan even though there's no science for a vegan diet. So we know that's not about science. So, and the other thing that I think needs to happen, and people are increasingly starting to discuss, is strategic litigation. Who can we sue? Uh, can we go after the American Diabetes Association for telling people to eat, uh, you know, to eat pancakes with maple syrup for breakfast when their own scientific statement is saying that's not healthy? Or, or Pepsi or Coke, is it time to go after them? Can we get the attorneys general who went after the tobacco companies maybe to go after some of these food companies? So, there's a number of strategies, and I think that, you know, with the science that we have and the people that we have and mobilizing a little bit more, um, I think that we can create change. I do. Because all you healthy people are testaments to, you know, all you are going to go out and, and, and you are all vectors in the world. And, uh, and, and this is spreading. Like, we are spreading. So sign up for the Nutrition Coalition. <laughs> That's my last plug. <laughs> Thank you. Great, thank you. I thought that was a really important question. Thank you. Um, next question, first question here. Hi, Dr. Rob Kiltz. Uh, I'm a physician, been practicing for years, and I've learned that the social media is the new social medicine. We do have to empower people, the community, the world, because more science and data, I call it snake oil and doo-doo sometimes, because doctors and scientists argue over piddly little data, but we forget about the people that can't understand any of it, and we somehow know the answer. So the question is, 
How can we simplify the story and empower the people? Well, we can't. They must do it themselves, and that's what's happening today. So why do we blame fat when sugar is actually the cause? Okay, that's so the question. Why do we blame fat? Um, okay, well, uh, this is a little self-serving, but I recommend you my book because... <laughs> No, it's, that's, it's a great book. It, thank you. It really tells that story. How do we get the idea that fat, saturated fat, cholesterol are bad for health? The Ansel Keys story, picked up by the American Heart Association, made into guidelines as of the early 60s, became official dogma. And then people who suggested that sugar was a problem, like John Yudkin at Imperial College in, in England, were attacked because that was a competing hypothesis, and they were buried and bullied. I mean, much as the way that many of us are <laughs> today. But those tactics go back to the 60s. And it's really an incredible story about an entrenched hypothesis that still has not, we've just not been able to dislodge it. Anything else to add? I don't think I'll go down. Uh, yeah. Could you pass the mic, Nina? Thanks. So why do we blame fat and I not couldn't sugar? agree more. So again, read her book. That's, that's really a start why we blame. But again, it's much more than that. I, as I said before, I'm still an optimist. Things are moving ahead. We, there is a recognition within the guidelines. The issue with the American Heart Association, they are not corrupt, they are more rigid. They want a certain level of evidence and sometimes no study does not mean no evidence. It's just no study. But now there is a shift clearly against the sugar movement in recognizing processed carbs, in recognizing not fats doesn't seem to be a problem. It's always going to be a baby step. Polyunsaturated fat is fine. And then eventually, I'm sure, we'll come to a point in saturated fats will be fine. Science and guidelines always change. And we are the ones who are going to make a change. But arguments are not going to make a change. More data is going to make that change. I guarantee you, in 10 years, we will have a class 1 a recommendation or a class three for sugars, whereas it's not right now. So remain optimistic, remain engaged. That's my message. <laughs> the optimism of a young researcher. <laughs> yes. <laughs> optimism <laughs> always brings the change. <laughs> I totally agree. Yes. Hi, this is Gloria, and I have a question that I think might affect to more than one person. Um, thinking of a person mid 60s, had a heart attack two years ago. Uh, had already been for a good while keto or low carb and has, had been deemed uh, metabolically healthy. Um, my, the concern that I have is the, one of the concerns is the blood sugar. The, sh the fasting blood sugars has, have always been between 115 and 120. Um, so my question is, is this, it's not that different than what before he had the statins, but the, but the statins, are they going to, what is the expectation? Are they going to start creeping up? Uh, is there a timeline? Is there a time when they usually start to come up, or, or is it never going to happen? Any questions, any answers would be great. Anybody? Uh, uh, that was a hard question for me to understand with the echo. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I, I couldn't completely understand your question, but since your sugars are a little high in the morning, it's possible that you're going towards the craft five because you don't look particularly heavy. It's not me. And, and okay, I'm sorry. It doesn't and then, matter. <laughs> and then I don't know whether you asked a statin question, but statins yes. are definitely going to make diabetes worse. So and, this person doesn't have diabetes? is a low carb person and has had fasting blood sugars for years in 115 to 120. Um, maybe I would bet that they are pre-diabetic or to some degree insulin resistant with those sugars. Or the maybe dawn phenomenon effect of elevated sugar in the morning. Uh, you know, that kind of individualization of a, is really difficult for a panel to take, I'm so sorry. That's all right. I'll yeah. come back with more questions. <laughs> yes. Hey, my name is William Harmon. I'm a practicing family physician in South Carolina where we have a lot of coronary artery disease. And so I found Dr. Nasir's uh, talk intriguing on the coronary artery calcium scoring. 
So my question is very specific. Um, what patient, basically what age and risk factors do you believe needs the, the, the scoring test, the calcium scoring test? Is it the person whose calculated risk score is low to determine who may actually be being missed as someone who has coronary disease? Or is it the person whose risk score is high and you're doing the test to determine, well, maybe they don't actually need to be on the statin? Actually, the thought piece has evolved, but just for the guidelines people where you are uncertain, but in reality, I believe everyone should have it after a certain age. What's the harm? It's Fifty to hundred dollars, radiation equivalent to a mammogram, takes two minutes, really clarifies your risk. And I can tell you, of course, we were called all healthy. If next year we had a calcium score out, CT scan out here, and all of you guys go, went and get a scan, almost half of them will you have plaque, and 25% will have brewing disease that we wouldn't have known that was significant enough. So in essence, almost everyone, unless there is a reason why not, to, if you already have an established hazard disease like a stent or a prior bypass or some of those, then you don't need it. Is there a certain age? 40 years and above, th less than 40 if you have metabolic syndrome, severe obesity, diabetic, or a strong family history of heart disease. Now, some people are, are not so cavalier about the irradiation of a mammogram or of a CT, CT scan. So could you do ultrasounds of, other, of the vascular system? I to would, get? Yeah. That's a fantastic point. So think about the radiation. I mean, cavalier isn't the right thing. No, a lot no, of the people radiation are concerned. is equivalent to if you would fly from New York to LA and back. That's the radiation. So again, I'm not dismissing it, but I'm saying once for a lifetime, five years is not an issue. Ultrasound would be amazing if it worked. Unfortunately, again and again, the data I showed, it's more of a reflection of the risk factors and doesn't really add above and beyond. But for me, that would have been an ideal, a carotid ultrasound, a peripheral vascular ultrasound. Unfortunately, for the risk of CVD, including, including stroke, doesn't really add much. So if you have one choice for uncertainty and risk, it's the calcium score. In an ideal world, if you are able to afford $4,000, then CT is great. But if for $50, this is the best test and the information that you're gonna get. Yes, yeah, so when will CT angiograms become more widely available? Yeah. Cost. I, so I, I, can, I, can, I can tell you that I, I'm a big fan of CTA if we can afford it as a society and, we, and not only that, putting in an IV and taking almost 45 minutes to do a test and 40 minutes to read a test, for what benefit? Uh -huh. Is it an yeah. inch or a mile? We have clearly seen that if your calcium score is zero, even a minimal amount of non-calcified plaque doesn't mean, but the future will be quite different than where we are right now. Sorry, David. That's okay. Okay, <laughs> so you did show a, a study, Karam, in which people with high coronary calcium had a lower rate of events when they were on a statin. What's really important is those people did not change their lifestyle. There is no evidence that they did anything, that they became low carb. We don't know anything about those people. So what I heard at the end of that question is, um, when does someone need to be on a statin? And uh, I would say, as a scientist, not as a clinician, not as an advisor, as a scientist, I would say no one needs to be on a statin. That <laughs> someone, for example, in the 4S that is at high risk, they can put themselves in the category of 4S that was in low risk. You have the control to be able to change your triglycerides and your HDL, your blood sugar, by changing your diet and lifestyle. You change your diet and lifestyle, you don't need to be on a statin. Thank you. Uh, let, let, let me answer this, and you know, I've been to multiple medical meetings and where it's all about lipids and statin, and you know, this is the polarization that plagues our society. That's what, what the issue is. Yes, it caused diabetes, but for individuals who had an HbA1c of 6.3 or 6.2 or 6.4, statins in the right population clearly has shown to regress the plaque, stabilize the plaque, make it high dense, reduce inflammation, and if it's all about inflammation, PCSK9 have shown the benefits almost the similar. Now, just because it works doesn't mean it's for everyone. That's the whole idea. But this notion that it's for nobody, I think so it's equally damaging and challenging to the society where a lot of patients who are high risk, and we deal with patients. You're sitting in front of me, you had a calcium score of 400, your LDL is 100, you're a low carb person, you're insulin resistant, so should I tell you 
I'm going to give you the evidence. This is where the evidence is. I think so that's what we need. We find to, need to find a middle ground because polarizing views will never help and it will continue to, I would say, increase the divide that exists and we'll never get to the right answers. That's my view because I deal with patients and we have seen the data and the data, it works in the right patients. Now, I completely agree with you, David, those patients might be on a low-carb diet who were taking statins and people who were not, but in my view, the low-carb community is very statin skeptic. So I'm, I'm not too sure that a lot of those patients would be on statin if they were low-carb diet. All taking a statin takes 11 patients to reduce one event. So again, talk to your doctor, think a little bit more about it. The answer so, is not or, it's somewhere in between and it's an and. Thank you, and, and just, I, Let me just make one, one more statement. On, I need to editorialize, and that is, you're so young and optimistic. Um, <laughs> every day, a patient comes to me and says the other doctors won't talk rationally about statin medicines. They, fearmonger and want to push it down the throat of my patients and they're using the old LDLC, the family docs, and this is in Duke University environs. So, so this is great if you can have a discussion, and, but that's why we're having the discussion here. Often the doctors aren't, aren't willing to have that discussion, David. So and I just look at this as a scientist. Let's just state as a fact, there has never been a study to look at coronary events in people on low carb diet there has never been a study on people on low-carb diet given statins. So we have to realize we have no data. Well, there's one on, ongoing. There's one data. Right. <laughs> but, and as much as I love Dave Feldman's work, he still hasn't looked at coronary events. So we don't know. And I'm saying historically... I can't say anything on that because it's ongoing. Okay, but let's just look in the published literature. We don't know about events in people in low-carb diet. For all we know, you're all gonna have a heart attack because you're on low-carb diet. We don't know. But I'm saying, emphasize, there has never been a study on statins given to people on low-carb diet, so there is a that's true. void. Yeah. And so that's why I emphasize no evidence. So yeah, and I there's... also emphasize there's no evidence jumping from an airplane without, with or without a parachute is gonna save your lives or not. Yes, so but... again, we are common sense people and we have to extrapolate. Okay, hang it on, time out, easy. time out. Next question, please. I, I forgot my question. <laughs> Not really. Uh, hi, Alan Schaefer, MD, LMHR, CAC0, um, pulmonary critical care, sleep, obesity, and metabolic health medicine, Albany, New York. My, um, I think two quick comments and then a quick question. I see optimism. I've been here doing these things for 15 years and the momentum we have, I am certain we are going to make the change that we need to change, partly and major because of all the people sitting there. I, look, I feel like I'm looking at the 27 Yankees here. This is amazing. So um, I just want to say uh, my question is, uh, Dave, is there an endpoint to your uh, new study that you've been thinking about for the past week or so or have you not gotten that far? I'm very interested in getting involved in that. Oh, well, yes. I, and of course, many people have asked me the, those questions over the last like hour. Again, these talks are brand new. They've been feverish. I've been talking with both Lundquist. I've been talking with uh, potential donors, uh, working also just talking with great people like Karam Nasir as to, you know, what would be realistic, what makes the most sense for what this confirmatory study is. And let me state plainly, a lot of what people were complaining about with this existing LMHR study, such as not having the control group, I 100% think, let's, sure, let's go ahead and work with that, right? You have your historical control in Miami, I mean. Yes, and it's great. I, I, can I just say just real quick, I'm so freaking thankful that Karam Nasir happened to have been doing Miami Heart because then we wouldn't have even been able to do the match controls. So when we get to finally do that analysis, it just wouldn't have happened had he not been doing that study. But I do want to say one other thing because I think it's kind of important. I obviously feel like um, I'm trying to do my best to be a good scientist at all stages of doing this. And it's why I wanted to even interrupt my own speech in the middle and saying, please continue to work with your doctor. Don't over... There's no single study, as excited as I am about even my own study, as much as I want to float on it right now, there's no single study that should have that much impact on your entire life's medical care. So, again, 
there may be cases that we ultimately find after we get the longitudinal uh, study. For example, there may be some genetic interactions with some particular people. All of those things are possible. And we may even find that those folks who are not LMHR status but in the more permissive group do in fact show that there's more nuance to it, right? The, the important point is that the confirmatory study is the case where we can really step forward and that's where we do want to have these conversations. And I like to have them, just like you're doing right now, before we lock down what that study is going to be. Because getting back to what I was saying before, unfortunately, too often, these decisions are made without everybody else in the room. And that's, I like this kind of science. I like where everyone stays in the room. And we can have this all on the table and talk about it first before we move forward. Wonderful. Are you looking at uh, doing uh, thyroid panels on these people because of what Amy said yesterday about the uh, correlation between cholesterol levels and thyroid? Thank you. Thyroid. If you don't use the microphone, right. don't use the microphone. So oh. you can um, are you thinking about looking at thyroid panels? Because as Amy was talking about yesterday, high cholesterol is often associated with low with uh, hypothyroidism. Yes, unfortunately, we didn't get thyroid panels. I've gotten so many freaking tests for this uh, study, but thyroid we didn't have. I'm going to tell you right now. Um, while I'm very limited in my knowledge of thyroid compared to Amy, I do think that as is already part of the lipid energy model, but we didn't get into that part yet, the uh, HPA axis and everything with the thyroid is relevant to full body lipolysis. So I expect, for example, T3 to typically be lower. Um, I am interested in things like reverse T3. I'm glad she brought that up. And that's relevant as well. But do I think hypothyroid, as is typical in somebody on a mixed diet, we could diagnose in the same way as we would with, say, lean mass hypersomatous? I'm a little more skeptical, but that's a, a longer discussion. Great, thank you. Next question. Hi, I'm uh, Craig Fletcher. I'm right, uh, lo uh, Denver local, and I'm an independent enthusiast, I'm not a doctor like all these awesome doctors. My cousin's a functional MD, and he invited me here. Um, so I feel really privileged to be able to hear from you guys and, and, and ask you a question, uh, just being here. But we, you've done a good job of squelching, I think, the lipid hypothesis, which for those who don't know what that, it's just that lipids are causative for heart disease. I think we've heard enough data and enough studies where that's squelched. What I'd like to hear more of in your future talks and, and ask you right now is, we know we see um, cholesterol particles and other particles in plaques. I mean, we see viruses, bacteria, and all kinds of things. What we didn't talk about is the underlying root cause of cardiovascular disease. How do they get in there in the first place? I think you should jam on that a little bit now, but in future talks, so th and then recommendations to avoid it. Because we know it's not LDL, so what is it? I certainly have uh, opinions. Unfortunately, they're very lengthy. It'd be like chat GBT if I, if I responded. So I'm going to hand so, it off to somebody who could put yeah, it short. Let's get a clinical response, briefer, you know. <clears throat> so you are saying what is cause of heart disease if it's not cholesterol. Underlying root cause, yeah. yeah. So I, I do think that LDL is involved in inflammation and repair. And you'll find an LDL molecule at the site of an atherosclerotic plaque. The fundamental question that I disagree about is that what is, what is it there to do? <clears throat> and I think it is there to do, it's there to heal the plaque, it's there to dampen the inflammation. It's not a causal factor. An association does not make causality. And that one fundamental aspect about it cannot be teased out by looking at all the molecular literature on causes of atherosclerosis or looking at all the clinical data. Could I be wrong? Yes, I could be. But based on 32 years of clinical experience, I have found that LDL and cholesterol does not correlate with heart disease as you would think. So I'll yeah. pass it on to Khuram so that he Thank can you. contradict this. And <laughs> Very brief. We don't know. Well, and can I just editorialize? We don't have to know. We don't I have mean, to know. Uh, we're, the, discussion, the discussion here is trying to, is it okay to have a high LDL right. when you're following a lifestyle that's fixed everything else? And you don't really have to prove, like the old Matlock show where the TV show, he would come in and not only exonerate his client, he, he would find the perpetrator and they'd run out at the end of the show of every, we don't have to know what it is. 
there is a book by Malcolm Kendrick that gets into the hundred other possibilities. And I remember an a abstract from a group in Boston. They said it was a periodontal disease. They said it was from the teeth. It's from the inflammation. So there could be so many sources of inflammation that well, then... Well, not necessarily inflammations like cholesterol, one of the contributors, because you have people with SLE, psoriasis, CRPs in the tens and up, meeting Jupiter criteria and having no plaque and doing pretty well. So again, it's, there are many things that's contributing. Lifestyle, hypertension, smoking. It's extremely heterogeneous. So making it a sound bite, it's inflammation, it's cholesterol. That's a disservice that we are doing. The answer is we don't know. There so are a lot of things. For this audience, look, out, look at the book, The Clot Thickens by Malcolm Kendrick. Has anyone read that book? Yeah. Is it, is it too simple to say that endothelial dysfunction and glycocalyx dysfunction is the beginning? Not necessarily. We in Miami Heart Study, we have looked at endothelial arterial reactivity, no correlation with any earlier soft plaque or anything. The whole endothelial function, it's so variable, it all depends what time of the day you're checking. So again, as I said, it's very easier to say yes and no, there's so much into it. Next question, please. Hi, Elizabeth Yurth. I'm Chief Medical Officer at Boulder Longevity Institute. And a couple questions. Um, number one, why aren't you guys using the new AI technology, the Clearly Scans, for your CTs instead of going on to CT angiograms, since we now have AI to be able to, to take your CT, your coronary CTs, and then take it a little further just by running it through AI algorithms, like clearly scan. And then number two, in your patients with the high LDLs, I, I have tons of patients with high LDLs. I do think it's a factor of the APOBA ratio that makes a difference, but also looking at myeloperoxidase, PLAC, and oxidized LDL as factors that are predictive. Are you looking at any of that? So at my end, you know, honestly, we start with a black burden. Honestly, APO A, B, C to Z doesn't really matter. And in the end, it's really what the disease is. Once we have the disease, so my opinion is risk factors do not predict risk. Risk factors are targets for management. So once you have the disease, then we personalize and tailor according to. We are all learning. I couldn't agree more we should do CTAs more, if more affordable, more easier. Unfortunately, that's not the case. Calcium does a fantastic job in lieu of that. Uh, actually, it's kind of funny. This topic came up last year, and you remember how I said we kind of ran into some bumps. <clears throat> I'm not sure if I'm allowed to share this, but I'm going to go ahead and share it. Um, it was, in fact, the case that in the middle of last year, there was, if you can call it this, concern that there wasn't a lot of plaque at baseline with our participants. So we did kind of have a sense that this might be an ongoing thing. Um, and at that time, there was a lot of discussions. We had some meetings. But a few months later, when I had met Dr. Budoff, his mood had entirely changed because, sure enough, AI-guided uh, scanning with CT angiograms has really been revolutionary. Like, literally, there's just been a huge revolution such that at very small levels of plaque, you really can get a better sense of what really had changed. And so once again, I, you know, as a technologist, I can't help but point out AI helping out again. So long as it's not Skynet, I think we're gonna be okay. <laughs> I, th I think the problem we have to look at here is we're focusing on like a CT, at, once it's abnormal, the disease is there. We need to look at how do we prevent the disease? Who, do, who is at risk, right? And, and so none of this yet is helping us to say who is the risk population. So we, we, we are starting a study. We are taking very high risk groups, more than 1,000 patients who have no plaque buildup. And we are going to try multiple interventions. One is going to be lipid lowering versus lifestyle that's really going to be low carb and versus more intensive lipid lowering therapy and doing repeating that CT because we have no idea what is the incidence and what causes plaque buildup. And hence, we have no idea what prevents it. So, in five years. <laughs> Hi, Leslie Keith. I'm uh, here with the Lipedema Project from Southern California. And I wanted to ask the panel if you have ever considered uh, the, the role that the lymphatics may play. Because I was struck by Dr. Nadir um, Ali's presentation when you gave the symptoms of lipotosticity, and those symptoms of someone who has a central lymphatic dysfunction. Um, and then uh, when Dr. Diamond talked about um, the increased fibrin levels, um, that's also a symptom of central lymphatic dysfunction. So I'm wondering if we are ignoring a very important system 
that might have implications of all of this. Uh, the lymphatic system transports cholesterol. Every long chain fatty acid has to go through the lymphatic system to be delivered to the, um, to the bloodstream. So are we ignoring the, the possibility that the person may have a central lymphatic dysfunction? Who's sticking up for the lymphatics? <laughs> Nadir. Uh, you, you need to come tomorrow afternoon and listen to Huggins. Shaban is going to I'm talking elaborate on yeah. that. Uh, but you know, I want to clarify that when I talk about lipotoxicity, I'm not talking about people who are metabolically healthy. Those people have all the license to eat as much fat as they want. And the people who are lipotoxic, they need a short period of time in which they are exercising and fasting and changing their diet and improving their blood markers before they can go on to a traditional low-carb diet. I just didn't have time to specify that. Mm -hmm. But I, I don't think I'm intelligent enough to talk about your <laughs> point, and I'll leave it to Shaban Huggins. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. So a, a shout out to all of the people watching, uh, watching live who are not in attendance, and thank you for the questions. I have a few here. Question for Nina Teicholz. In the Brazilian dietary guidelines, no less than five of the 10 steps to healthy eating warn against processed foods. Were you aware of this? And maybe what if we pique the pride of the DGAC by asking why the USA is so far behind Brazil? Um, that's a, it's a really interesting question, this uh, idea of trying to warn people against ultra-processed food, and, it's, and ultra processed food, there's a system called NOVA that was created by Carlos Montero, who's a Brazilian, for the Brazilian guidelines. And it's, you know, it's a work in progress, is what I want to say. Like, it, it, it gets at a lot of things that we would all consider highly processed food. Highly processed food, in my mind, is, should be defined like pornography. Like, we can't define it, but you know it when you see it. You know, it's like, <laughs> but the system, you know, like definitely things like chips and cookies and crackers is defined as highly processed, but so are, um, you know, prosciutto and salami. And so it's, it needs those, those problems in my mind. And so as a hamburger, when I, I actually interviewed uh, Ms. Dr. Montero, and I said, why is a hamburger a highly processed food? And he said, well, you know, people tend to eat that with a lot of junk. So I, that it was, to me, not great reasoning. So, um, so I just think that, that that it is potentially promising, but it needs to, it needs, some of these kinks need to be worked out, in my view. Now, how about uh, another question from online, uh, and we'll go down the, the, the row here. If someone's not eating carbohydrate, they're in nutritional ketosis. It kind of seems to me like we're living on the moon, and all the studies have been done on Earth. I mean, carb eaters. Carb eaters are in the MESA study. I bet 99.9% .9 are eating lots of carbohydrates. What about people who aren't eating carbohydrates? And, and if we don't have data, can we predict? So a common question I, I hear is, so let's say you have a high calcium score. You don't have the power of zero. What do you do? I mean, you're doing keto. Do you add statins? Do you, do you just monitor it over time? And, and uh, so let's just take each, uh, maybe Nina, unless you didn't. Yeah, so just pass along. <laughs> you're our guideline expert. Well, of course, you're preaching to the choir. Obviously, I think we should only be studying healthy people, but as a diet, whether it was keto or any diet, as it becomes more prominent, you want to be looking at the people who seem to be thriving on that diet and then have that data to be able to make use of and leverage. Yeah, but, but my patient, the, the question is, I, I've had a calcium score. It's, let me give you a number, it's 300. And what do I do? I'm doing keto and, and I don't want a heart attack. And I guess they didn't say if it was primary or secondary prevention. But are you reassured that you know, keto is enough? Should I add a statin? Should I look at other risk factors? And if you don't know yet, that's, I know these guys will have something to say. Nadir, how do so, you counsel your patients? Uh, the, the important thing to know is that how metabolically healthy that person is. So let's say this person is metabolically healthy, insulin resistant, low triglycerides, high HDL, no evidence of lipotoxicity. I'm sure that this person can actually take in some carbs, and I don't think we should demonize carbs completely, 
because sometimes periodic releases and bursts of insulin are important for us to build muscle mass, to improve our memory, because these things do happen. So the more metabolically healthy you are, the greater the carb tolerance that you will have. And occasional periods of using carbs is not necessarily bad. Now, as far as the calcium score is concerned, I think that the best study on calcium score comes from Cooper's Clinic, which took a lot of people with calcium and divided them according to their exercise and metabolic health. So people who were sedentary with high triglycerides, people in the middle who were kind of middle of the road exercise and people who would exercise greater than seven hours per week. Even though the people who would exercise greater, the big exercises, they had a higher calcium score compared to the sedentary people, but they had lower event rate. They had lower events of strokes and heart attacks. So calcium score is not the end all. I have patients in my practice with over three to 6,000 of calcium who have remained stable in good metabolic health with lifestyle changes. Great, so, but, so those studies among carb eaters apply to those who don't eat carbohydrates? So again, you know, <laughs> so much uncertainty, but let's find where there could be some commonality or we can extrapolate. So in Mesa, you have diabetics and obese diabetics. So again, that's one extreme. Then you have individuals with no risk factors who are non-diabetic and non-obese. Let's focus on that group. Yeah, let's focus on yeah. that group. So again, yes, if you're diabetic and obese as a group, more likely you're gonna have a higher prevalence and burden of calcium score. But still, about 35% of those had a calcium score of zero. Naturally, people who had no risk factors and possibly insulin less, we weren't checking insulins, but now we had HbA1c, were fine. About 42% have some plaque buildup. About 20% of them had minimal plaque. Now, you can be a diabetic and an obese, has the calcium score of zero, your 10-year risk on an average, not everyone, is about 3%. And you can have no risk factors, non-diabetic, good exercise capacity, and have minimal calcium score. On an average, your risk is around 7%. So, if you if, have a calcium, yeah. If you eat carbohydrate. I don't I'm, know. Well, no, I know. So again, oh. most likely, I'm, sure I'm just saying they're gonna be healthy. So all I'm trying to say is, till we have, if you, the answer is it's all about diet, I'm just telling you it ain't. Well, the you common have, ground you could have be the to think medi more beyond, and now we have to extrapolate. So for me, right now, telling someone with no risk factors who's healthy living, and by the way, in the Cooper study, you're absolutely right, as a group, the exercisers and healthy lifestyles had a lesser event. But if you look at the sub-analysis, individuals, even those marathon runners who had a very high calcium score as a group, they had much higher events than sedentary individuals who had no calcium or minimal calcium score. So in the end, your disease matter. All I'm trying to say, don't ignore that. Always pursue extreme healthy lifestyle. But if you have disease, you are vulnerable. And just try to find out what other options are there beyond just a low carb diet. David, did you want to? Yeah. Uh, Thank you. Karam, you, you may add to this because you know more about the coronary calcium. As far as I know, all of the work is correlational. It is epidemiology. I don't know of a single study of a placebo-controlled intervention to either stabilize or reduce coronary calcium or, or stop an increase in coronary calcium. People are always asking me. I, I hear, my score is 100 or 200 or 400. What should I do? And I don't know of any intervention. Obviously, a healthy lifestyle makes sense. Uh, maybe it's genetic. Uh, I do think potentially vitamin K2 is relevant because it potentially will help to direct the calcium into the bones and away from the arteries. But I, I don't think that's actually been shown experimentally. So uh, I don't think we have the experiment done yet to tell us. Yeah, I think that's... By accurate. the way, you're absolutely right. There are not many studies done, but there are not studies done one way or another. So let me tell you what the studies have done. So if 
calcification is not going down. It's some flag. So if anybody's trying to think about LDL or your HbA1c, so you're, you're in there for a disappointment. I don't ever have a calcium score that my calcium, it's a flag, it's a part of the healing process. The more calcium, the more non-calcified plaque, the more turbulence, the more outcomes. There is never a plateau that at that calcium score, your levels is comes. So if your goal is getting your calcium from 150 to 50, ain't happening. But if your goal is making sure that a calcium of 100, now you're at risk for a heart attack and stroke. And by the way, I see everyone's talking all about all-cause mortality, unless and until stroke doesn't matter to you. That's fine. If your whole purpose is in the next three years, ah, this study didn't reduce my all-cause mortality, so I don't care. Maybe it reduced strokes, who cares? So it's up to you. I'm just gonna leave it there. And, our job as physician, you know, the problem is we dictate. We shouldn't be dictating. Our role is to inform. And you guys are the ones to decide. But take your health very seriously and avoid the polarizing view because in the end, it's your health that matters the most. Thank you. We're running out of time. I just am trying to summarize here that sometimes in the low-carb nutritional ketosis world, we see things that haven't been seen before like reversal of diabetes, all of these other problems. And so I, I'm still I'm hearing this and saying that we don't know what to do when you have a calcium score. The power of zero is great, but once the calcium score is up here, you may be able to reverse I, it. There are I some anecdotes. I had a anecdotes. patient exactly on a low-carb <laughs> keto diet with a calcium score of 600 was also on a little bit on a statin, and his calcium score went up, and he has the same question, I, what does that mean? We got a CTA, he has a moderate amount of non-calcified plaque, new that's still brewing. All I'm trying to say is, there's so much that needs to be done. If yeah. you have disease, take it extremely seriously, because we have enough evidence now that if you have high disease, it doesn't matter. You're black, white, Hispanic, old, young, men, women, metabolically healthy, diabetic, non-diabetic, you are at risk. Yes, follow the healthy lifestyle, but there are many additional options that you should consider till David and others can come up with a study that shows that those interventions do not work if you are on a low-carb diet. So, so glad you could come to this meeting to hear the other panelists. And I, I'm going to have to cut off the, the um, questions at this time. I, let's thank the panel again for a wonderful morning. Thank you.